several questions. There. I'm going I'm to say that, yeah, as, I, as I said, I think what they got wrong was the lead up to it. Um, the, they were looking in the wrong place and framing the, the questions in the wrong way and, and not seeing the crime scene, as Danny uh, Schechter memorably puts it, and aptly, I think. Um, you know, since the, and, and Wolfgang's right, I mean, it's, it's kind of tragic in a way because this, the, the buildup to the crisis occurred during the worst possible time financially for these media companies. Uh, even if, even as resources were um, being lost, uh, there was also a loss of uh, status, prestige, confidence. These places became anxiety factories, I can tell you, because I was, I was in them. I was at the Wall Street Journal during some of this period. And, and the ability to mobilize your shrinking news platform against a uh, Wall Street giant it decreased as the, as the time went on. I often cite this, the stat, and I'm going on too long, but I often cite the stat that in the mid-90s, Dow Jones, which owns the Wall Street Journal, was as big as Morgan Stanley. I mean, in, 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 the, in, at the, in 2006, 2007, it wasn't even close. It was, it, it, it was, a, it was a mismatch. So anyway, so there's, there's that, and, and you know, as far as covering the crisis, it's been this kind of wild roller coaster ride, and, and the journalists, I think, my, my impression of them, I, I compared them to the, to the uh, London Fire Department during the Blitz, you know, they've been going from one catastrophe to, to another, each more complex than the next, and, and, and basically trying to get their heads around it, and um, the quality press I think has failed in a couple of big ways, but um, which I, I get into, but uh, basically it's been a mad scramble and, and uh, you know, there's been, you know, one, you can't deny there's been some excellent work done. Damien, now your research, you've got a background in law, also in political science, and your research report basically just addresses what are financial journalists for? So what conclusions did you come <clears throat> up with? Um, well, I, ca I came up with the conclusion that financial journalists in this time of all times have a bit of a <clears throat> identity crisis about what they've thought. On one hand, they uh, see themselves as providing information to investors. And um, Millicent was, was talking about the, the problems of self-fulfilling prophecies that that, that that entails. But on the other hand, they have this slightly difficult watchdog function. Um, and, I think, uh, and, and I think the financial journalists really have a difficulty reconciling these things. And one way to think about all the various points that we've, we've been dealing with today is to, to ask the, the question, if we accept that financial and business journalists have some sort of watchdog role, and if you speak to regulators and central bankers and others, and you ask them about financial journalists and, and, and how they do their job, they say, absolutely, we need financial journalists to help hold companies to account to hold regulators to account and regulatory mm -hmm. failure to account, um, and they're on our side. But if you ask the question now, when it comes to the next crisis, will it be any different? Will journalists do a better job? Will consumers and users and readers uh, demand smarter information, discriminate more between those, those providers which are providing different kinds of information? I think in the light of what Wolfgang said, and what we all know, given the broader crisis of, of funding journalism, the answer has got to be no. Which is why I think that you know, the European Journalism Centre has been um, doing the right thing in trying to create a forum for debate and trying to push the debate forward. And it's absolutely crucial that in the situation in which uh, news companies, totally focused on the bottom line, um, are unable to... Um, think about how to make this work. Um, <clears throat> people like the EJC are prepared to do that. I think subsidies are absolutely part of the um, picture, and you can start with the shopping list uh, that Leonard Downey Jr. and Michael Schutzen came up in their report published a couple of weeks ago on journalism more generally of um, interventions and new approaches to how to fund journalism which would enable um, uh, things like subsidies, tax breaks, uh, philanthropy and collaborations with universities, for example, may be ways in which somehow we can assure, ensure that when, even when media companies are doing badly, journalism can do its job 
a little bit better. So I think we need to have more of these discussions, and it won't happen on its own. Well, one man who's going to get it happening here for us, Danny Schechter. Danny. You know, I, Stephen, I thought you were breaking down the crisis earlier into these different time periods was very useful. You know, we had an initial period of, of incredible denial on the part of a lot of people in the media. You referenced this, Dean. You said, you know, they didn't do a good job early on in the crisis in, in recognizing how serious it w could be and all the rest of it. But I just wonder if, if they're doing much of a better job right now. In other words, it seems as if there are a lot of forces. We heard about them earlier. The lobbyists, the, the administrations, the politicians who want this problem to disappear. You know, it's, it's over. We, we're getting recovery. Uh, you know, let's not worry about reform. Not necessary anymore. You know, it's sort of, you know, here today, gone tomorrow in this sort of attention deficit culture that we all live in. And I, how can we, as people who see this problem as far more structural, systemic, more serious, etc., encourage our own media outlets and our own constituencies, so to speak, to, to recognize this, to recognize that, you know, this is something that, that we have to learn, derive some lessons from, and we have to do uh, a continuing, ongoing coverage of. Because what I fear is, you know, there's, there's a good day at the market, and boom, nobody wants to talk about this anymore. It was referenced earlier. If, if the market was at 16,000, nobody would care about anything. Anyway, I don't agree with that, but I, I heard that. And I, I just think that how can we, we have to be sort of advocates, not for a particular policy proposal, but for the, the, the work that we do. We have to r get other, others to recognize the importance of it and the seriousness of it, it seems to me. How do we do that? Steve, do you want to pick up on it first and Wolfgang will come right to sure. you? Sure. I mean, I think there, there are a couple of things going on here that are very interesting. One is that um, when, it, when is it in the interest of people to go public on things and when isn't it? Right now, we're in the phase where the lobbyists, in a sense, or the industry are trying to push back a bit from the demand for regulation, or at least they're trying to shape that. Now, it's not really in their interest to have that debate out that publicly. There is a debate going on. It comes out in, for example, the hedge fund regulation we've heard about. But in general, it's a more effective debate held within committees than it is, in my mind, to the public. And it's quite difficult. It's, so there's a question of who now wants to talk about this. The second thing is, I think, there's an exhaustion in the mind of the public, in a sense, over this crisis, and almost a hope to return to normalcy. We had the same thing in the 20s, the famous you know, return to normalcy. And I think we're getting a sort of exhaustion, both in the public and, and among editors, about, you know, sort of how much more we can still go on about this crisis. Can't we move on to other topics now? And that's, I think, a serious problem for the coverage. And then there's one third thing, which I think we forget, which is that actually it's not that these choices are technically complicated. It's also that they're politically difficult. Because why did this, why was this boom allowed to go on so long? It wasn't just ignorance. It was also politics in the sense that no one wants to be the first government who gets up and says, I'm sorry, you can't get that mortgage. I'm sorry, you can't buy that new car. We're going to restrict credit. And the measures that we're talking about to control the crisis are essentially measures that are going to be extremely politically unpopular if they're ever implemented. It's going to be, for example, in the UK context, back to the 70s, where the bank said, unless you've put savings in for the last two years, five years, you can't get a mortgage with us. It's going to be measures saying, you know, we're no longer going to get, you know, allow you to borrow the kind of money you're able to do. You're not going to be able to move out of your parents' house and get a house. So these things are not popular with politicians. They're not going to be easy to implement. So I don't think people, you know, I think therefore there's a political resistance to actually taking these hard decisions now that the crisis is over. And that's reflected in the loss of momentum that you're discussing. The fact that underneath what seem to be very technical choices, there are really big and hard political decisions that everyone would like to avoid making down the line. Wolfgang, you wanted to come in here? Yeah, just, just, uh, just briefly. I mean, I think newspapers in particular are asymmetric bubble enhancers. When the bubble goes, it's because of the business model. They pull it up, they talk, they talk it up. And business magazines did the same thing, all these herograms of the, of, the, you know, of, the, of, the, of the chief executives of the banks. And when the bubble blows, then they are the first, <clears throat> they will obviously, you know, write about it, but then